And that's what it was. Amen? Amen. Mercy, sacrifice, love. Amen? Amen? So we could all go free. Wouldn't have to suffer in hell forever. Amen? Amen. Absolutely. Well, it's good to be to be back with you guys. I tell you what, um, I told somebody back there a while ago, I think we were here about four or five months ago. I mean, I know it was a year, but it seems like about four or five months, maybe. I tell you, it's just flying by. And that, the 2015 went by really fast. I don't know if it did for y'all or not, but it did for us. Amen? And so we, we, had a, we always have a good time with you guys, but it sure does seem like it gets here quicker every year. Uh, but we love that, so we just uh, appreciate you guys having let us be back. I, I, I think we've lost count how many years in a row we've done this first Sunday. I don't, I don't even remember. Don't, I guess it matters. We're here every Sunday, every year for the last ever how many, and we're here again. And then, so that's all that we're here. So that, that's, what, that's what matters. We're just here. And so here's what we're going to do this morning. Turn with me in your Bible. If you type, have your Bible, and I pray you have got your Bible. The book of Colossians. Colossians, the first chapter, is where I want us to, to spend some time this morning. We're going to look at just two verses this morning. Verses 28 and 29, the very last two verses of Colossians chapter 1. And, and the, the title of the message this morning, I guess if it has a title, I'll spend a lot of time on titles. But it's Paul's view of ministry. Here, here's what's important about the book of Colossians. Now, the, the book of Colossians honestly, is one of my favorite of Paul's letters. Now, it's not the most celebrated as far as the theological basis of it. It's probably way down the line somewhere. Uh, that would go to Romans or Galatians or maybe Ephesians and somewhere along there. But Colossians is, is sort of down the ladder when the theologians look at the letter. But here's why I like it so much. The book of Colossians, this letter, is unique. It is the only letter Paul wrote to a church that he never visited. Nowhere at any point in time was Paul ever able to get to Colossae. So that meant this. These people never got to see Paul in action. They never got to hear him in person. The only communication that Paul had with this group of people and the only thing they could get from him was this letter. Now, there may have been others that they were copied because they would do this and send them from church to church, and they may have got some of those as well. But the only one we know of is this one. Now, here's the thought, just at least for me. When you look into the letter of the Colossians, you find that Paul gets down to some real basic principles and thoughts and beliefs and, and doctrines in this letter that he doesn't... He doesn't spend as much time on in the other letters if he spends any time on them at all. And here's why I think that is. All the other, all the other churches that are mentioned, Paul was able to visit. He taught a lot of things in person. And as he wrote back to those churches, he would then build on those doctrines that he taught in person. He would build on them with the letters he would write. So he would mention things that he taught in person, that he told them while he was there, and then build and expand on those things. But not here. He couldn't do that. He'd never been here. He never had the opportunity to talk to these people and say, look, here is what I do. Here is why I do it. Here is how I get it done. He was never able to do those things with this church. So in any number of passages throughout this letter, you just get some ground floor, bottom, I mean, just, just the, the, the basic stuff here. And this is what I want us to look at this morning in these two verses. In these two verses, Paul sort of sums up, to some degree, exactly what he's about. What he does, how he does it, what, why he does it, all of these things that, he, that are important to him are summed up in these two verses. And so that's what I want us to focus on this morning. So now I know you found that after all that. You found these verses. So let's read them. Starting in verse 28. He says, We proclaim Him, admonishing and teaching everyone with all wisdom, so that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. To this end I labor, struggling with all His energy, which so powerfully works in me. Let's go to the Lord in prayer for just a moment. 
And then let's look at these verses, these two verses for a few moments. Father, we give you praise and honor and glory for the privilege that it is to be in your house today. To sing your praises and lift up your name. And Father, I pray that with all the songs that we have sung this morning, if there is anybody in this room who's never given their heart and life to Christ as their Savior, I pray somehow one of these songs, the message, the verse, what's been said, these verses we're going to look at here in a portion of them, would speak to their heart and stir their heart about their need to be saved. Father, that you're not a good way. You're not the best way. You're the only way. And if they're going to be in heaven, if they're going to know you as Savior, they can't get it any other way than calling on your name. Father, I pray that if there's anybody in this room who's not done that, I don't care how long they've been going to this church or anybody else's church. It's not about the church. It's about you. If they're going to be saved, they're going to come to you. So Father, I pray that if there's someone in this room who has not at any point in their life called on you to be saved, I pray they do that before they leave this room. Father, with all of your power, I know you can't make anybody do anything. You will do that. But Father, with all of your power, I just pray you would not let anybody walk out those doors back there without you in the door. With all of your convicting power, your drawing power, I pray you do a work. We would surrender and come to you today. For we ask it in the precious, wonderful name of Jesus. Amen. Now Paul starts out with, what, with, with a little bit about what he's all about in this first verse, in verse 28. In that verse 28, he makes three very distinct statements about what he's about. And what he says first is, the first thing that he says in that 28th verse, when he goes to laying this out, and, and this is specific in its own purpose, he says, we proclaim Him. Are y'all awake? We proclaim Him. Amen? So what does He mean by that? What does that mean, we proclaim Him? Why does He say that? Here's what that means. It means that Paul's number one, top of the line thing, first thing out, of the, first rattle out of the box, so to speak, is He talks about Jesus. First off, who He is. Who is Jesus? The Bible says that Jesus is the only begotten Son of God who died, who lived a sinless life, died on the cross for the sins of the world, was buried in a tomb, raised on the third day, went back to heaven, and is coming back to get His church. Amen. Now that's what the Bible says about who Jesus is. Amen? Amen. Now let me, let me let you in on a little something. You probably already know this, but let me let you in on it too. Anyway, there isn't anybody else like Him. <laughs> Amen? There is not anybody else like Him. He stands alone. He's not one in a crowd. He's not one in few. He is one and only. Just, that's what I love about that song. Vanessa and I sang that about there a while ago, right after we did the trio stuff. He's not a good way. He's not the best way. He's the only way. Because there is no one who has done, because that's the second thing you talk about, who He is and what He's done. And there is no one who has ever done for you what Jesus has done for you. I don't care who you point to. You know, I, I'm always amused. And maybe I just don't get something or something, but I'll just stay ignorant if I have to. This is the way to, But I've never understood these people who think that they're going to get life from someone who's not alive. How do you get life from someone who doesn't live? All the other religious leaders of the world have lived and they have taught, and many of them have taught some good things. I give them that. But you know what? They all died and stayed dead. Buddha's dead. <coughs> Mohammed is dead. There's a tomb. You can go, they will let you in there, but you could go visit him. Elvis is dead. <laughs> I love to say that because people say, Elvis is not a religion. 
uh, just run over to Memphis this month. <laughs> You'll change your mind. Is this his birthday or his death day? I don't remember which one. One of us in January. I don't remember which one it is. It don't really matter. That dude's dead. Amen? But Jesus is alive. You know why Paul says we proclaim Him? Right first thing out of the box? It's because there is no one who has done what Jesus has done. He's the only one who has conquered death and is alive. And people need to hear that. They at least need to be made aware of it. You say, well, they won't believe it. That's their problem. But they need to hear it. That the opportunity is given to them to believe in Christ and be saved. That's why Paul said we proclaim Him. Now, where do we get in trouble on this one? You say, well, we, you know, we, we, talk, we proclaim Jesus the only way of salvation. That's true. That's true. But here's our problem. Much of the time, we don't have that fact up front first. When we talk to people, we have a tendency as Baptist folk to talk about ourselves first. To talk about our church, what we do, what we offer, where we do things. You know what that sounds like to lost people? And I've talked to people who have been saved later in life and, and, and people have tried to talk to them and, and, and get them to come to church and get them to come. because they, and, You know what that sounds like? It sounds to lost people. Because I've asked them, several of them and they've all pretty much said the same thing different ways but the same way. Same basic thing and here's the thing. When a lost person listens to you trying to get them to come to this church, all they hear is you trying to get them to come to a place they don't want to go at a time they don't want to be here. <laughs> With no solid reason why it's that important. Because we never get to Jesus. See, we have a good fellowship. But they get fellowship with the Quantum Club. We have good meals, but boy, the Lions Club put on a good barbecue. We have ways that you can serve and help the community. <laughs> uh, which one of them, which one of those organizations don't do that? You see, they can get fellowship in places, they can get service to the community in places, they can get they can get good meals in places. But the only place they can get Jesus is here. Amen. Amen. That's why they need to be here. Yes. That's why they that's what they need to understand about being here. That first and foremost, it's about Jesus. And who He is and what He's done for them so they can be saved. Amen. We're not just trying to get them to come and join another organization. Most people are too busy with that stuff in the first place. We need to make sure that they understand we need them to come here because their soul for eternity is at stake here. And Jesus is the only one Amen. Who's done anything about that? Amen? Amen. Amen? You start off with that. You give them a reason why they should be here at 1030 on a Sunday morning. Yes. A reason they can't get anywhere else. And that's Jesus. Amen. That's why Paul said, we proclaim Him. First thing in that verse. Right up front. Then he said, we admonish or warn everyone. That's the next thing. Warn everyone. The word admonish that we read in the scripture, the little word, the Greek text, means to warn. So when Paul said we proclaim who Jesus is and what he has done, the second thing on that list, he said we warn everyone. Warn everyone about what? Warn people of the consequences of missing Jesus. Amen. And I said what I meant. The consequences of missing Jesus. 
The consequences of missing Jesus is that you will spend eternity, for all eternity, separated and apart from Jesus for all the rest of eternity. That's the consequences. And the reasons why you missed Him are inconsequential when it comes to the consequences Amen. of the choice you make. In other words, it doesn't make any difference what's keeping you from Jesus. You're going to find out it wasn't worth it. I don't care what it is. I don't care what it is. And Paul says the second thing we need to be about is not only proclaiming who Jesus is and getting Him right in front of everybody, but we need to tell people, hey, here's what He's done. Here's what He'll do in you. Here's what He did for you. But if you don't do that, if you don't come to Him, here's what's going to happen. Amen. Here's what's going to happen. And the Bible is explicitly clear on this. Right. If you die without Christ as your Savior, you're going to spend eternity in a place called hell. Right. Amen. And if you want to get in trouble at the average Baptist church this day and time, just preach a good strong sermon on hell. There are people who just come unwrapped. I've been, I, I've had people argue with me, uh, chastise me for preaching on hell. You know, and I have people argue. They won't come out and argue. They come out and have, you know, they'll come out and say, well, preacher, I just don't believe in hell. And I just look at them and say, well, let me ask you something. Do you believe in heaven? Do you know I've never had anybody say no yet? I've never had anybody say no yet. And I, do you believe in it? Well, yeah. I said, okay, let me, let me ask you another question. Open your Bible and show me where Jesus is lying. Because the same mouth that told me of, tells you of heaven that you do believe in tells you of hell that you don't believe in. So either Jesus is lying somewhere or you're wrong. Now, they don't like that. When I confront them with that, they don't like it. But, you know, but I'm trying to show them something. Look, heaven and hell are both real. Amen. And you're going to be in one or the other. <laughs> and the determining factor is not what church you go to, or how long you've been going there, or how good you are, or what you've done, or how much you help people. It's what you've done with Jesus. Amen. Have you come to Christ and accepted Him as your personal Savior? That's the dividing line. Period. That's what the Scripture says. <clears throat> and people need to hear that. Amen. I'm not telling you they're going to like it. But they need to hear it. Because out there in our world, what we've got, we've got this somehow, I don't know where they get it, this concocted idea that somehow you can live a separated and apart from Jesus and just do the best you can in this life and at some point when you die somehow you're going to make a turn over to Jesus and everything's going to turn out okay. Uh -huh. oh. That's just not true. It's just flat not true. You live this entire life separated and apart from Jesus after you die you know what you're going to continue? Separated and apart from Jesus. Another place, but the same condition. The place changes, but the condition doesn't. You have to make that choice to choose Jesus now in order to change the place to Him. Simple as that. And I've had people come to me and, 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 and you know and say, well, preacher, I'm just not sure we you know we ought to we ought to preach on hell. We don't want to scare anybody. You ever had them say that to you? I've had them say that to me time and time. I've had them say that to me many times. We don't want to scare anybody. And uh, I know what they mean, and I, I get that. But my thought to them is simply this. So you would rather let them die and go there instead of tell them the truth about it before they get there. Now, I know what they mean. I know what, because I've seen this done, and I don't like it either. You know, get a bunch of kids or youth back in a room somewhere and just scare the bridges off of them with a big gory story about hell. I've seen that done. I, you know, I know people who do it. I don't do it. 
But to completely back away from the truth of the scripture about a place called hell is also wrong. Amen. And that's what we've done. Because the truth of the matter is, you die without Christ, that's where you're going to be. That's where you're going to be. And you know, one of the greatest preachers of the last century, Dr. R.G. Lee, in one of his books, I've got several of them, in one of his books he says, about talking about his own personal testimony, he said, had it not been for a fear of the fact of hell, I may have never started for Jesus. He started, he came to Christ because he determined, look, <laughs> I don't know much about him, but I don't want to go there. Think about this, he didn't stay in that mentality. He grew in to know exactly who Jesus and preached him to literally millions for years. He's on the edge. But his initial step to Christ was because he heard about the reality of the place called hell. And if that this morning would cause you to step here to Brother Roger in a few minutes and say, you know, preacher, uh, I, I want Jesus. Amen. Then I'm going to jump down. I'll jump up down all the way to glory over you. That's pretty much his limit today. So like, Amen. Amen. He said we admonish everyone. Next thing in that verse, still in that verse, next thing it says, it says we're teaching everyone. Teaching everyone what? The promises and principles that are found in the Word of God that the Christian is to live by. You can't live by what's in here if you don't know what's in here. You can't stand on the promises that you don't know exist. Paul says our teaching, we need to teach everyone. Once they are saved, then we need, to, we need to teach everyone the principles and promises of the Word of God. And he qualifies this in there. He says teaching with all wisdom. With all wisdom. Now what does that mean? What does he mean when he says with all wisdom? Here's what he means. You've got to look at the definition of the word wisdom. Let me give you the, just the good old down-to-earth definition. You go read a lot of fancy definitions. Let me give you one that's just easy to remember, and this is absolutely sums it up perfectly. You ready? Wisdom is what you do with what you know. Amen. What you do with what you know. And it is different from knowledge. I know some brilliant people. But in some ways, they've done this as stump. <laughs> They don't know what to do with all they know. They're not wise. I have met people over the years that could quote more scripture than I know. But they never come to church. They never have anything to do with church. They never have anything to do with Jesus. They quote you scripture. They know scripture. But they don't know Jesus. They're not very wise about what they're doing. I see Christians all the time. You know stuff in that Bible. You know there's stuff, principles and thoughts and truths in that Bible. And you don't do it. I don't do it. We're not very wise about these things. What Paul is saying here is teaching everyone with all wisdom is not just filling the heads of people full of a bunch of, bunch of principles and knowledge, but showing them how it works in life. Amen. How it plays out in your everyday walk with Jesus. Amen. How it applies to areas of life. How you can use it. That it affects how you live and those around you. It's not enough just to know. You've got to do something with what you know. There's probably not a single person in this room. Men's this is the first Sunday of the year. There's probably not a single person in this, in this room that doesn't know what you have to do to lose weight. <laughs> You know what the difference is? Wisdom! <laughs> Amen? It's doing what you know. Not just knowing it. Just because you know it don't mean you're going to lose weight between now and next year. You've got to do something with what you know. 
Just because you know there's something in the Word of God, you've got to do something with it. You know that the Word of God says we're to study and should to study and read it to show ourselves approved, but do you? We know that the Word of God says that we are as His children to pray to Him and pray without ceasing and pray fervently. But do we? We know that the Word of God says for us not to forsake the assembling of ourselves together as His children. But do we? That's the point. <laughs> Just knowing it ain't going to help you much. You got to apply what you know Amen. for it to have much effect. Amen? Amen? Paul sums this all up. We proclaim him, that's the first thing. And we warn everyone about the consequences of missing Him. And we teach everyone of the principles and promises of the Word of God. That's what Paul was about. Everywhere he went. Every place he went. That's what he was about. And that's what he lays it out simply in that one verse. What the Colossian church ought to be about. And what Van Sickle ought to be about. Amen. And every other church. But then that's just that one verse, and it's not even the whole verse. Look at what he says next after that, to, to, uh, teaching everyone with all wisdom. Look what it says. There's a comma, and it says, so that. That's a transitional phrase. Here's his, here, now we're getting into why. That's what. Here's why. Look at what he says. So that we may present everyone perfect in Christ. You know, what does that mean? Well, you know what it means. It means exactly what it says. It means that Paul's goal, Paul's goal was that every person where he went got saved and began to learn and be taught and grow and be mature. That word perfect in the Greek it's not really a good transla translation of the word. That word perfect means mature or complete. It doesn't mean without fault. It means mature. That you've grown up in Christ. That you've learned it and you're applying it and it's actually working out in your life. That's what that means. Paul's goal was that every person that every person he could get to, every town he entered, that every person in that town, number one, get saved, number two, begin to grow and mature, and at some point stand before Christ, a complete child of God, at some point after they die. You say, are you kidding? Everybody? Yeah, everybody. Now let me get you in a little something that I, that, that I can't prove this. But I also can't find where it happened either. As far as we know, Paul never met that goal anywhere he went. There's no recorded place where Paul went where every person in that town or community got saved. And every person in that town or community began to grow in Christ. Some did. Some did everywhere he went. But at no point, as far as we know, did everybody get saved and mature for us. He never reached that goal anywhere. But he never stopped putting that as the goal. That's the point. That's the point. He never lowered that goal. After going to Corinth and, and running into all the issues he ran into with those people. This is the example here. He didn't then turn his eyes over to Ephesus and say, well, I'm just going to go for half of them here. No. His goal was all. His goal was all. 
What's our goal? I ask churches this all the time, but some of them don't like it. But what's our goal? Is our goal everybody? I'm going to. I'm going to just assume. I'm going to jump out here and just say no. That everybody within five miles of this church is not your goal. He said, well, how do you know that? Now, this may hurt. You ready? It's not even your goal to reach everybody that's on the membership level. Because I would guarantee you about 30 to 40% of them ain't heard a word from this church in years. Now, that's average. I've always been amused. We'll have a church with 1,000 on roll and 200 to come. Where's the mother 800? If our goal is everybody, why aren't we reaching the 800 that's supposed to be here already? See, I told you that's not fun. For some reason, the church today, and I... I I'm going to work this in somehow because this has been something that's just become evident and obvious to me. It's not popular, but it's evident and obvious to me. The church today is having a tendency to lower expectations. I told a group of pastors about two months ago that I was talking to uh, about some revival efforts and some things we're going to do. And some of them, are, a couple of them, are kind of arguing with me a little bit about revivals, how they work and they don't work. Do this, they do that, do something else. I said, "Well, guys, I, I, I don't know. I, I know I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer, and there's a whole lot of people smarter than me. But I said the way I see it is the further we get from revivals and evangelistic events and the further we get from preaching the gospel as often and many times as we can, the lower our membership gets, the lower our attendance gets, and the lower our baptisms go. And that is a downward spiral for the past 10 years in Babylon. I said, now, revivals may not work. If that's what they don't work, that's fine. All I want you to do, and I said this to them, all I want you to do is tell me what we can replace it with because what we're doing ain't working either. I said, I've never understood how you can take the Word of God and lower the expectations of people living up to the Word of God and get anybody mature. So many churches, they, their expectations are if we can just get them here on Sunday morning, that's fine with us. That's about the best we can do. Excuse me. Is that the Word of God? The church in Acts met every day. For years. No matter if he walked into a city of 500 or a million, <laughs> he walked in with the attitude, every one of these people need to be saved. And we're going to give them. Or die trying. Amen. Amen. How is this going? I personally just me. I personally don't think we should have any less of a goal. Just me. Just me. You say, well, that'd be an awfully big job. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely. No doubt about it. It was for Paul. 
But he talks about that too. Not only talk about what? He not only talked about why. He talked about how. Look at verse 29. To this end. Another transitional phrase. To this end. I labor. Struggle. With all his energy. Which so powerfully works in me. You know what that verse says? In order to meet this goal, I work at it. Did, I, I'm sorry, but the, 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 the truth of the matter is this, simply. There is no magic potion por, portion or program that you can pour out over a church and it does the work for you. When it all boils down to something, it all boils down to this. This is work. Version, different versions use different words. Work, labor, striving, toiling strenuously. The Greek word there where he says struggle, it means to work to the point of exhaustion. Reaching people with the gospel is work. It always has been. Paul said it right here. It's never been something that was easy. It's been a work. And it's been a work that even Paul says how he gets it done. Paul's not with all his energy so powerfully works in me. What is he saying here? He's saying, look, this is not about my physical ability to do things. This is about the Spirit of God energizing me when my body says sit down and be quiet. The Spirit of God says do something else. It's not about the energy that I have in my physical body. I have people say to me all the time, well, Heavenly Paul, I just don't have much energy doing it. And I get this all the time. I get this constantly. Every week, every year, I have people come to me at some point during the week and want to know what kind of vitamins I take. I have people come to me every week. Where do you get your energy? Because I'm pretty calm this morning. Sometimes I just come totally unzipped. <laughs> and it's not me. It's not this physical body, I guarantee you. It's not. It's about the Spirit of God just taking over in these moments. Amen. Amen. That's what it's about. And you know what? He's not doing anything and he won't do it you. He'll do it anybody who will let him. We're so busy trying to tell him what we can't do. He can't get to what we could do. in you and through you, you never dreamed. Amen. Yes. I know that for a fact. I've seen, I've seen him do it through others. I tell people all the time, look. <laughs> and this is truth. It'd take you about five minutes <coughs> and maybe, probably not that long, but I'll give you a maximum of five minutes, but it won't take that long to find somebody who preach better than I can. It won't take you five minutes. To find somebody to sing better than I can. That's truth. I'd give anything if I could if I could sing like David Phillips of the Gaither Golden Way. That can just scream like a girl and stay up there and do it for measures on end. It ought to be illegal for one guy to have that much voice. Do you know what? I can't do that. But because I can't do that, does that mean I can't do anything? That's the point. I'm going to let you in a little secret. 
what talent or abilities that you have that God's put within you, that's what you got. That's what you got. I would love to be able to sing on the National Quartet Convention, but it ain't happening. Why? That's just, I'm just not there. That, mean I do, that don't mean I just sit down and do nothing. Let me tell you something. Get this, all right? What the talents and abilities you've got, God's given you. And you really don't have a lot of control over what God's put within you. It's His gift. But the one thing that every one of us has absolute control is the effort and energy we put behind those gifts to glorify Jesus. Like I said, in five minutes you can find somebody to preach better than you. Five minutes you can find somebody to sing better than you. But you're going to have to look long and hard to find somebody who works at it hard. But that's just the truth. But that's what we'll tell you. You just go ask her. I'm thinking all the time. I'll be driving down the road and I'll be thinking about something. Sometimes we'll be driving down the road and I'll say, write this down. I'm always thinking and looking for what God can do. Nobody. You might find hard, somebody work hard. Works harder than I do that. You're going to have to find some. You're going to take some time. Because I go at it like there's no tomorrow. Why? Because that's what I've got control of. That's the part that I can say, Lord, this is the voice i got. Thank you for it. This is the ability to preach I've got. Thank you for it. And then do everything in my power to get every ounce out of it that I can get out of it. Amen. And so can you. So can you. You may not be the most talented, but you can take what you've got and you can work at it with all your heart. My finger twitched. <laughs> and you can let God get the absolute most He can possibly squeeze out of you for His glory. Amen. That's what Paul's talking about. That's what he's talking about. The question is, Child of God in this room, are we letting Him do that? Or are, that's my, over the last couple of years, my favorite little word. For some reason, I'll work out this, but I, are we just piddling with the things of God? Are we just piddling around with it? We'll come over here and dabble in a little something for a few weeks and just, we're gone again. Dabble a little over here because we kind of enjoy that. Dabble a little over here because maybe we like this part. Just pity. Now and then, here and there. But not really committed and driven down to put in our effort in the place God wants us to let Him get everything He can out of us. What an awesome thought for a new year. So that this last, this next one, don't turn out just like this last one. We come to the end of next year thinking, well, I guess I probably could have done more. Or I wish I'd been more faithful. I wish I'd done this or that or something else. If you're sitting in this room safe today, let me give let you in a little secret. God has a very high expectation of you. <coughs> Because he paid a very high price for you. He paid a high price. And he, ex he has a high expectation. <coughs> Commit yourself right now to start striving for that expectation God has for you. Don't settle and don't pity. Strive. Yeah. For that expectation. If 
you're sitting in this room this morning, and you've never given your heart to Christ, I don't care how many churches you've been a member of in your life. I don't care how long you've been going to those churches. I don't care how many times you've been baptized or by what method. If you can't find a moment in your life when you came to the person of Jesus for the purpose of asking Him to save you and forgive you and be your Savior. My invitation to you is extremely simple. Run to this pastor. Don't waste another breath. Run to this pastor. And simply say this. Pastor, I want Jesus. Amen. And before you leave this room, you can have Jesus in your there is absolutely no good reason for you to leave here without Jesus today. Amen. Now you may come up with a flimsy excuse, but there is no good reason for you to leave here without Christ. So my invitation is don't leave here without Christ. Let's pray. Father, Lord, I pray right now for every person in this room. I pray for every Christian in this room. There would be a, they would begin to strive to meet that expectation that you have. That expectation is born out in Scripture for us to be like Christ, to conform to Christ. Father, I pray that we would commit ourselves as your children starting right here on the first Sunday of this brand new year to strive this year to be like Jesus. It's a high and lofty expectation. But with your power, your blessing, we can get to at least part of it. We can at least strive towards it. Father, I pray we commit ourselves to that. And Lord, I pray for that person who's sitting in this room who's never been saved. Never given their heart to you. Father, I pray they wouldn't start this new year out by staying the same way they were last year. Lost. In danger of missing heaven. Depending on so many other things that are never going to work to save them. I pray they come right here in the pastor. And if all they can get out of their mouth is, Pastor, I want Jesus, then get here and say that. Father, I pray that's exactly what you do. For we ask it in the precious wonderful name of Jesus this morning. Amen. Amen. We stand and we sing, I have decided to follow Jesus. And as we sing this song, Brother Rogers, right here where I told you would be, there's plenty of space for you to come and kneel and, and just make some thought, get have the commitments to the Lord. If you need to come this morning, you come while we sing this song.